Hello, my name is João Vasco Carneiro, and I'm a graduate research assistant at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, I would like to thank my co-author and advisor, Dr. Hans-Peter Schaub. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking about post-docking spacecraft dynamics using Baumgart stabilization methods. And to introduce this topic to you, I'm sort of going to start with the motivation. Um, there's obviously been a lot of talk about space sustainability um, because we want to make sure that space is accessible to future generations, uh, but that currently faces a lot of challenges. Uh, for example, there is a large number of inoperative satellites, the current estimates of about two years ago, um, say that there's roughly 3,200 on-orbit uh, satellites. Um, and also, another challenge is that um, there is a finite number of slots for some very high value uh, orbits. For example, this geostationary orbit. There's you know eighteen hundred slots, about a third of which is roughly have been roughly filled. Um, and so there is a, this really big need for life extension or satellite removal missions, uh, which require docking between two spacecraft. Um, there's been some interest from government agencies. Um, NASA started docking um, missions back with the Gemini program, um, continued with the shuttle, and, and now they're launching these OSAM-1 mission. ESA is also interested. Uh, they're launching uh, Clear Space One. But there's also been interest by private companies. Um, and for example, Northrop Grumman is, is uh, building its own life extension vehicle called the MEV, this miss mission extension vehicle. So there's obviously a lot of interest in docking dynamics and docking missions, um, but to make sure that the uh, missions are feasible, uh, we need to be able to simulate these dynamics, these spacecraft dynamics. Uh, and so that's what we're proposing. That's that's the approach that we're proposing uh, in this uh, in this work. So I'm going to start with the problem statement, and um, we wanted to make it as general as possible, but also feel like it's realistic. And so. For our problem statement, we have two spacecraft, spacecraft one and spacecraft two. Um, each has their own um, body frame, either B1 or B2, which is centered at the center of mass of those spacecraft. We assume that the spacecraft are rigid. Each spacecraft has a connection point, uh, P1 and P2, and they're connected through a rigid arm. Um, again, we wanted to make this, uh, this problem statement realistic, and so uh, that's why we're using rigid connections. Um, we don't make a lot of assumptions. Obviously, the spacecraft are rigid, but we do want to, in the future to relax that assumption and, and you know have spacecraft that have hinged solar panels or reaction wheels or something like that. And so we actually explore three different um, constraints or I guess relationships between the two spacecraft. Um, all of them have a you know require a rigid arm between connection points P1 and P2. But the first one, the length constraint, just enforces that points P1 and P2 are um, at a fixed length apart. And what this means is that, yes, they're connected, but um, each spacecraft can rotate about uh, their connection points. So there's basically a spherical hinge on point P1 and point P2 as well. Um, the second constraint that we uh, developed is the direction constraint. So we basically remove the spherical hinge um, on spacecraft P1. And so that is fixed now, uh, but spacecraft 2 can still rotate about connection point P2. Um, and so now we, we went from a one degree of freedom constraint to a three degree of freedom constraint. And the final um, you know, constraint that we uh, explored is this rigid constraint. So basically, we now remove the spherical hinge on point P2, and we, you know, there are no more hinges, and this basically makes spacecraft one and two locked, uh, both on the translation side of things and on the rotation side of things. So um, we obviously start off uh, simple with just a one degree of freedom uh, constraint, but then we move on to more complex and more rigid connections, and we actually end up with a six degree of freedom uh, constraint. Um, so we've been talking about all these constraints. What, what do they mean? How do we define them? Um, so these spacecraft relationships are defined, uh, using these holonomic constraints. So the holonomic constraint is defined by this function psi, and it is holonomic because it is only dependent on the first order states. So it can only be dependent on attitude or position, right? 
And so we can define these constraints, but we need a way to enforce them, right? And the way we enforce them is through these constraint forces and torques. And um, taking a look at the, the constraint forces, we need to define a direction and we need to define a magnitude. So for the direction, we actually use the spatial gradient of the constraint. And what this means is that the constraint force will always act perpendicular to the constraint surface. And this actually makes sense from a physical standpoint. Uh, if the goal of the constraint force is to make sure that the constraint isn't being violated, um, we don't want the constraint force to act on the uh, constraint surface. We only want to make sure that when the system is violates that constraint, is outside of that constraint surface, we want the constraint force to take it back to that constraint surface uh, through the shortest path, which is perpendicular to the constraint surface. As for the magnitude, it is defined by these Lagra this Lagrange multiplier. Uh, now, in classical mechanics, you and for simpler systems, you can actually analytically compute what this Lagrange multiplier is. However, in our case, um, we want to try to avoid that. And that is because we want to simulate complex systems that are attached to each other. And if you have a spacecraft with reaction wheels and hinged solar panels and all of that, it is incredibly difficult to solve for the analytic solution of this Lagrange multiplier. And so the alternative in our solution is to use the Baumgart stabilization method. So basically, instead of calculating the Lagrange multiplier analytically, we actually compute it numerically. Uh, from the constraint errors. Uh, we actually have two formulations. We have a proportional derivative formulation and a proportional integral derivative formulation. And so what we do is we leverage these classical control um, techniques to analytically compute the Lagrange multiplier. So the, this lambda value uh, you know, for the PD formulation depends on the uh, constraint error and their rate. For the PID formulation, it also um, uh, depends on the error integral. And the idea is if the system if the system goes away from that constraint surface, right? If the error grows, so does the Lagrange multiplier. That makes the constraint force larger. And so that makes the system go back to that constraint surface faster. Um, so basically we're numerically sort of enforcing the, uh, the constraints and making sure that the system snaps back to that constraint surface uh, as fast as possible. So uh, there is a lot of uh, math mathematical derivations uh, in the paper, and you know, I in the paper we go through all the um, each of the constraints that I talked about before, and we define what the constraint is and define how we implement those. So I'm just going to uh, skip that, and I'll, I'll let you read the paper if that interests you. But I'm just going to jump into the actual numerical results. Um, and first off, I'm going to start with the constraint overview. Um, so this, these plots are just to intuitively show what each constraint is doing. Uh, and so all of these are shown in the spacecraft's one body frame. So it's almost as if we're attached to spacecraft one and, and, and looking at the system. Um, and so on the left side with the length constraint, what we see is that points B1 and P1 are fixed. That makes sense. We're attached to spacecraft one. But point B2 and P2 actually have a trajectory to them. Um, that is because there is a hinge, a spherical hinge on both point P1 and on point P2, and so they're free to rotate. What I will say, though, is that the length, the distance between point P2 and P1 is fixed, um, and also the distance between point B2 and P2 is also fixed. Uh, you, you, don't, you can't really tell from the, uh, from the still image, but that does confirm that they're just sort of rotating in sort of a spherical surface. In the middle plot, we actually uh, implemented direction constraint. So now we remove the hinge from point P1. And what we see is that from spacecraft zone's perspective, point P2 is now fixed, right? Because the only hinge is on point P2. And so that's what spacecraft 2 is going to rotate about. Um, and, and that's what we, this green trajectory is, the center of mass of spacecraft 2 sort of rotating. And again, that the distance between uh, that green trajectory and the and point P two is fixed. 
And finally, with the rigid constraint, we lock the, the two spacecraft together. It's a six degree of freedom uh, constraint. And so we see that all points are fixed in this um, in the spacecraft's one frame. So that's exactly what we uh, expect from these results. And just, you know, it's a qualitative assessment that, you know, the constraints are actually being met and that the, the behavior of the system makes sense. So for the PD formulation, we actually uh, did some gain analysis because we figured that uh, you know, choosing appropriate gains will be important, and it actually is. So what we see in these two plots, on the left one is the translational constraint violation, and the right plot is the uh, rotational constraint violation, and we're using the rigid constraint for all these uh, scenarios. And what we see is that uh, as we increase the gains, we actually get better performance. We get We get lower constraint violations, However, uh, at some point, it's, it looks like for 10 to the third, at some point, the results just plateau and increasing the gains doesn't really increase performance. Um, we suspect that this is because of, you know, numerical errors or, uh, you know, just integrate integration uh, limitations. Uh, but the truth is that at some point, the, the gains just, the, the performance just plateaus and it, it doesn't really make sense to uh, increase the gains uh, anymore. And that also has an impact, um, which we'll talk about later. When we in, in, include the integral component, um, we see similar behavior. We also see that the results plateau. But what we see is that they plateau an order of magnitude earlier. So instead of plateauing for 10 to the third and 10 to the fourth, it actually plateaus at 10 to the second. Um, and so, uh, you know, the results are Again, similar, but we actually get the same performance with an order of magnitude lower gains. And that is important because uh, the higher the gains, the um, um, slower the simulation actually runs. So these two plots show the runtime performance. And I will just uh, point out that they're both in uh, logarithmic scales, both axes are in logarithmic scales. And so what we see here is that for, for both the PD formulation and the PID formulation, the runtimes are similar for the same uh, values of the games. Uh, there's not much difference there. But the key um, consideration here is that because the uh, performance plateaus a order of magnitude earlier for the PID formulation, we can use 10 to the second gain instead of 10 to the third gains, right? And what that means is that instead of having a runtime of about 200 seconds for 10 to the third gains, we can actually use 10 to the second and get a runtime of about 20 to 30 seconds. So that is a order of magnitude improvement um, in runtime with the exact same um, you know, constraint violation performance. So adding that integral gain really helps out in, uh, in making the simulation run faster. We've also analyzed how the system behaves when it's uh, stress tested. So um, we've actually done a, an orbital maneuver and an attitude maneuver. So in this, in this scenario, we um, apply a thrust at the five minute mark that lasts a minute. And so what we see is, you know, at that five minute mark, the constraints sort of spike up but then afterwards, they're able to the the the, the stabilization method is able to settle down and go back to uh, having very little constraint violations. And you know, the higher the gains, the uh, faster this um, convergence is, and the better the the results are. Uh, so this is for the orbital where we where we just uh, fire the thrusters for the attitude maneuver. At the five minute mark, we just tell spacecraft one to move to another. Um, uh, to, to a reference attitude. And because it's a rigid constraint, because it's a rigid constraint, um, the entire system moves to that attitude, right? And so we see similar behavior. There's that there's a spike in the constraint violations at the five minute mark, but then it quickly um, settles down and we get similar performance. So um, this, these are great results. All right, and so to conclude, um, we formulated the relationship between these, the system, these two spacecraft, using holonomic constraints, and we've enforced those constraints using this Baumgart stabilization method. Um, we've explored three different constraints of increased uh, rigidity, um, and what we show is that for the PD gain analysis, we show that 
performance is dependent on the gains up to a certain point. And at that point, it just plateaus. And using a PID formulation instead, we can get the same performance with an order of magnitude better runtime, which is very, very important. And finally, we've also uh, shown that the method is robust to orbital and attitude maneuvers.